Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Science of SaaS Startups podcast. Today, I'm talking to Arvin Draganovic. Uh, uh, Arvin is the co-founder and CEO of Layerize. They're a product onboarding SaaS solution. Arvin, welcome. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me. So I just want to kick things off by asking uh, a few questions to help the audience get to know you a little bit as a person. So first question, yep. big one. Do you believe in aliens? Um, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we're not, not alone not... in this universe. Um, you know, the universe is vast, um, too vast for to comprehend uh, what is out there. So I think it's it's extremely boring not to believe that there is out there, that there's something out there we can really articulate whether it exists or not. So I, I hope so. Um, and, you know, hopefully um, um, we will get um, them to visit us um, um, at some point. Definitely while I'm alive, because I will definitely love, love to see their um, look in their face. I, I'm reading, uh, just completely off topic, but I, I'm reading yep. uh, an, an amazing book at the moment called um, Project Hail Mary by, uh, by Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's all about kind of a, a first encounter with, uh, with an alien. And it's, it's really, really scientific. And uh, yep. I absolutely love it. I'd recommend it to anybody out there. So <laughs> just get that in. You know, I, I'm I'm uh, somewhat in, in uh, kind of well read within that space. You know, if if you read about how we expect it will be to to meet aliens, you know, and it it is somewhat of a rather dramatic first meeting, right? Is is so you know you never know how they will react and vice versa. So, but but nevertheless, let's be optimistic, and and I think there is tons to learn from from just thinking about there are aliens out there. Yeah. Okay. Great stuff. So. Next question is, what do you fear regretting at the end of your life? Oh, um, I am, I fear oblivion, you know, um, you know, being forgotten mm -hmm. and not uh, having done enough. Um, I think uh, since, the, um, since I remember kind of, um, you know, um, having my own thoughts, I always thought, you know, it would be um, a rather waste of time not to make something better and i think for me being able to do that and maybe somebody um, you know having um, some kind of um, uh, improvement of life with that i think that's a kind of um, thing that i'm definitely afraid of not achieving if you will yeah okay and, and when you were growing up what what songs do you remember growing up to oh man so um, my background i'm born bosnian right so a lot of the music that I've been listening to has been Bosnian music. Um, and um, that is kind of what my parents have kind of been playing in, you know, in, in, in the stereo. And those are kind of the songs that still to this day, when I play them, I, I kind of remember those days of being young. It takes you back home. So how, how would you describe... How would you describe Bo Bosnian music? I can't say I've listened to, to too much. Great, <laughs> great. <laughs> it's um, it's you know, Bosnian music is if if you listen to some of the that old sevda, it's very traditional. It's very um, kind of uh, it's all about feelings. Um, and it's slow. Um, so when you know it's it's that music you listen to when you really want to kind of get the deep connection with yourself. It's it's great um, kind of source of of getting in touch with yourself. I, I would definitely recommend. However, it might be a bit difficult to actually get in love with um, if you're not fluent in Bosnian. I would say. Okay, All right. fair enough. So um, so now like if we if we jump into to layerize a little bit, do you want to kick things yes. off and and just give us an overview of the company and and what you're trying to do? Sure. Um, Lera is, is an end-to-end -end post sales suite. And what we provide is a platform for brands around the, the globe to and at at ease and at in an efficient way to connect to their customers uh, through anything that relates to post sales. Specifically, um, what we have tend to focus on is the user manuals, the user guides. It has different, different names depending on um, where we are in the world, but it's the information that is at this stage is, is provided to a customer after purchase. Uh, and what we provide is a tool that does not only provide that at a much better um, rate, but also is more digital. It provides the brand a way to recognize who the customers are. Um, and in that context, uh, what we then achieve is a 
at you know at first a connection between the brand, the product that has been purchased, and the end customer of the day. Something that historically has never really been um, able to to be achieved. Uh, if we then look at some of the statistics, you know, nine out of ten modern customers who go down to the local store or go online to buy something are never recognized by a brand. Um, and in those cases where they are recognized is because somebody has an issue. So what we do is definitely kind of turn that a bit around and say, hey, post sales is extremely important and that, that experience about providing instructions, help, support, troubleshooting, um, additional and beneficial experiences is then what we provide in what we call the, the automation of post sales. And are you building the, these guides for your customers or is it a platform that they can build their own guides on? No, so so we are a platform. Uh, we do not um, create content. We create tools for how you can create content that is uh, something that your customers are then interested in reading. Um, you know, there is this industri industry truth that um, today's user manuals are not created for the purpose for the end user to read them. It's is done due to compliance reasons and you know then eventually what you have is um watered down version of information that is just offered to customers and in 2021 you know um if you are a bit uh, interested in you know your uh, customer um, loyalty, um, uh, satisfaction, and so on and so forward, those metrics, you definitely want to provide them with something that is, doesn't have to be unique, it definitely can, but just something that is at pair with the expectation of a customer when buying a product, whether that is, you know, whatever the price level of that is. So we provide all the tooling for them to create content, distribute the content, measure the utilization of that, and also consumption, and so on and so forward. While doing so, we can then suddenly recognize who the customer is. And then also with that recognition, we can then do a number of additional tools on top of that, which is, you know, marketing abilities, uh, marketing enrichment, and so on and so forth. Yeah. I mean, are you aiming this uh, product companies or like uh, software company, technology companies or, or both? And no, so we are only focusing on hardware manufacturers. Uh, okay. brands who produce anything, let's say kitchen appliances, it can be um, uh, bicycles, EV brands, anything that has a physical um, product, that's what we focus on. Software space, we don't touch. You know, um, when we started a company, we basically went at it in a pretty academical fashion. You know, we definitely decided to say, okay, let's come up with a number of hypotheses and figure out whether this saying that nobody reads the manual uh, that we, you know, um, that we tried to validate among our friends and colleagues. Everybody said, I never read them. You know, I take them out, put them in the trash can. They come in 10 different languages. I only need one plus when I read them I can't really understand anything what is inside and I want something that I can search and it's something I can look up and so we took that initial feedback and then ran a global um, survey to pretty to pretty much pretty fast validate that nobody engages with these things um, so um, we then decided to kind of um, to say okay uh, software companies out there have a number of tools. So that tooling for onboarding their customers to software is, is somewhat there. Really it's pretty well established. Developed. Yeah, well, well established domain. A little bit. However, yeah. yeah. However, you know, if you're a hardware manufacturer selling something through, let's say, Amazon or, you know, third party brick and mortar stores in Australia, but you're doing it out of Denmark or US, you have no way of controlling, managing um, those cost, that customer expectation because it's at the distance, it does not allow you to do so. So suddenly, if you cannot rely on the um, user manual to do the work, what do you then do? So we provide this tool uh, only for hardware manufacturers of hardware products. Um, and what we call this tool is we, um, we, we, we then allow them to create a, a product assistant, not a user manual, not something that a customer just needs to read that is cognitively heavy, but something that gives you know, benefits by utilization that might be reminders about a certain thing needs to be maintained that might be um, a certain uh, information about warranty can i save my proof of purchase there can i use that for anything beneficial so our platform um, provides a universal kind of way of dealing with you know 
um, benefit for actions uh, for an end user, right? So yes, I would like to register, but I also want to get something out of it. Uh, and that is that kind of um, product assistant uh, interface that we provide. I mean, it definitely feels like one of those technologies you look at and you think, yes, of course we need this. Like, mm -hmm. why hasn't this already existed? Um, exactly. I mean, how, how is it delivered to the end user? Is it an app or like what, what, what's the, the method so, of delivery? Yeah. So, so, so Layer Eyes is not um, a B2C brand. We are B2B. We provide um, a, a platform for our brands to then create a product assistance. A product assistant is a web uh, progressive application. It, live, it lives just in normal browser. It looks and feels right. like a native application. But one of the abilities we have and i think one of the reasons why this resonates so well with the brands and our customers is that you know the technology abilities just allow us to do things at scale however we also do not require the end user to go to the play store app store download install those things just cut away so we can focus on you know quick scan on something and instantly you then uh, presented with this universe of opportunities that uh, tries to engage you in a form of hey let me be your friend, let me assist you. So we can educate, but we can also provide additional information, we can entertain, and so on and so forth. So that's the the, the way the system works. It's an instant PWA, progressive web application. Yeah. Okay, so if we kind of talk about data a little bit, I mean, you, you touched on it a moment ago, and obviously customer data is a huge focus for every company at the moment. And usually, like when we buy a product, as a customer, you know, beyond perhaps some market research studies that when a company would ring you up and follow up or send you yeah. an email, that, that's kind yeah. of the end of the story, right? Absolutely. Can, can, can you explain a little bit how Layerize continues that story for co companies after the purchase? Yes, so there, there are a number of layers here. If, if we look at the traditional uh, user manual, if we talk to a um, technical writer, which will be the person in charge of, of doing these things, and we will ask them, you know, what do you know about how much of this PDF or this printed uh, book that you send uh, is being read? They will say zero. So that's the first thing we then take care of. We, we, we are measuring the consumption and we look for patterns of reading. We also tracking and collecting content feedback. What is good? What is bad? What needs to be changed? Um, it's hard to explain something in that is technical for everybody. Somebody has a pre-existing knowledge and can easily understand what they need to do. Other people do not have that ability. So being able to kind of get that feedback is essential for improving. And while this is kind of a digital uh, solution, that continuous improvement of your content is available instead of the you know the conventional you need to reprint it you need to resend it and so on and so forward so the content data the con data metrics is something we track the second part is who the customer is again nine out of ten customers out there are unrecognized so that's something we then coupling with with our knowledge with our contextual knowledge when a, cu a customer then scans an assistant and, and uses that we know what product it is we all know so where they are and through some uh, mechanics of registrations we can then build a pretty good graph of of their or who they are and also provide that back to the the brand and now suddenly the brand has a much better understanding that this is a first-time customer or a second-time customer and can over a lifetime um, not only look at what they have read, what they have not read, how well have they maintained the product, but also whether they go further down in purchasing more, whether they're willing to recommend um, the brand, the product, and so on and so forward. So the metrical ability to track is, is immense. And that's, that, that's something uh, we also do. And do you see other companies out there doing a similar thing to you at the moment? Um, no, I think uh, there are adjacent players out there that um, solve uh, uh, the, you know, they solve the blame and not the issue. And that is by providing an over the top, let's say a, a bot uh, that the, that the, yeah. with, with okay. the idea, it should just be able to answer questions and, and um, help by offloading some of that repetitive questions in terms of CS, customer success. Yeah. Um, but we, we, would like, we, we, we like to focus on the problem. And the problem is not being able to efficiently provide your customers with the information about the product. Every customer out there who has purchased something would like to sell service. 
because if I can fix it, if I if I need if I can get some help or just a quick read to what I need to do here, I will actually like to do so. Our studies, our research show that. And again, most customers go online to search for help, then actually writing an email to a support um, ticketing system uh, because it's much easier for them, and they would rather have a second you know, person help, peer-to-peer -peer help, then waiting on that email to come in from the support team saying, hey, this is what you need to do because that takes time mm -hmm. and that is that's cognitively heavy uh, activity to do. Yeah, and, and obviously when there's any new category, like scale is everything, right? Owning that market share before people are waking yeah. up to, to what you're doing. So, so how yeah. do you plan to grow this internationally? Do, do you just see it as a direct sales model or are you planning to work through partners? So, you know, we are um, well aware that our uh, position in the market is something we have because we have been, you know, I think the timing is perfect uh, in terms of what we deliver and what the market needs, not only in terms of uh, technical abilities, being able to buy this as a SaaS platform, but also, you know, customers or brands only are well aware that their customers, you know, require maybe a more environmental friendly solution. Um, so therefore, that's kind of way the printed manual heavy lifting, let's do something digitally, it really resonates well. So what we are focusing on right now, and, you know, um, less than, um, less than um, 12 months after our uh, pre-seed and, and then also a couple of year, a couple of months back our um, uh, seed funding is um, commercial growth and, and the way that we build uh, that is inside sales um, and I think for us what we have done well is most SaaS companies that utilize inside sales mechanics struggle to fin find out who the customers are you know they, they, they somehow need to have this x vision to see what the customer is potentially using as software uh, to see can we do a better job here and so on to to, to bid in for, for that budget for us that is extremely easy to do you know we are probably maybe the last SaaS company that is that places something as stupid as paper yeah um, right and i think for us that that is really something we are then focusing hard on on creating a model of sales model that 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 taps into that opportunity yeah. so i just wanted to to kind of jump into like the startup life a little bit so you just mentioned there that you've taken um uh, some seed rounds so far up to around four million uh, is it uh, four million euros uh, so far yeah. that you've had investment Correct. And you, you raised um, a million euros a month after starting the company in a pre-seed round. Um, yeah. Can you explain kind of what you had at that point? Was it just an yeah. idea and a deck or did you add some kind of demo? Like no, so, so I think uh, on to that point, uh, what we did is we spent a lot of time thinking about due to our kind of... Um, you know, as founders, we come from a product engineering and design heavy background. Uh, so we, we spend a lot of time trying to understand the crucibles of how to pull this off, what is required, uh, going probably beyond uh, the initial kind of market ready MVP solution. Um, and we wanted to have a number of uh, customers that we can raise the first round on. Uh, and okay. when we raised our pre-seed, which is rather unconventional for a startup is we did that by saying we only want money for commercializing usually when you raise pre-seed you do that yeah, for, yeah. i have an idea can can you you know i need somebody to put back in this up we didn't want to do that we, we knew that the idea was the solid based on our kind of both customer um, and also research then we definitely want to kind of leapfrog that and and then raise the the, the uh, um, a, a small round just to kick start the the, the commercial uh, activities so you had a working solution on day one of starting the company, did you? Yes, we did. We, yeah. we, we had a, a working solution. We had a couple of customers and we showed early traction. Um, you know, um, um, that was that for us was kind of an indicator that everything we built as a, as a, as a team, a very small team, we could then regenerate back in more usage, uh, more um, activity by the customer base, both on the paying client side, but also the end user um, side. And how did you get in front of those investors? Were they people you already knew? 
when we called our first investor um, and told him about this, um, and that was an investor I have known for more than 10 years due to kind of my, my experience in the startup community, um, you know, um, they were like, finally, you know, finally uh, you have maybe uh, decided to do something on your own instead of uh, working for, for different companies. So, so okay, I think that yeah. for us has been utilizing that relationship, uh, that trustworthiness. And I think for as a company, as a, as a founders, we are rather investable. Uh, I will say, um, rather, we were super classical as, as, a, as a business, you know, we like to understand the product, the mechanics of it, and then and then raise around uh, uh, on top of that, which for an investor's perspective, removes a, um, a lot of risk if you, if you want. Yeah, sure. And do you remember when you very first came up with the idea for Layer Rise? And do you remember like what the, the first steps you took to take it out of your head and actually make it something real in the world? Yeah, you know, articulating it as, as clearly as we do today, you know, back then was we wanted to challenge the way that the market has decided to solve uh, post-sales activities. Again, specifically down to this problem, this very well understood and also um, problem we could, we, could, we could measure, which is user manual. Like, why are you keeping on producing, spending time and money when nobody's utilizing it? Nobody within the brand um, believes in it and none of the customers get any value out of it. That sounds like a perfect thing to solve, right? Where, where all parties are like, yes, please give me uh, um, a pill if, if, if you want to, to, to get rid of this pain. Yeah. Um, and and the, the, the idea didn't really come to me as kind of um, an epiphany one day. It, it's something that um, as a thing, as a product guy, um, I always always kind of question things why is this like that like um, why am I getting these things why is it so when I buy a pretty high-end screen that I still get like five different languages that I don't understand it doesn't really make sense to me um, so we, we just based on that kind of initial idea and hunch and then a product kind of thinking we then expanded on the idea more and more to really understand the holistic product strategy that we can take and why kind of solving this initial user manual with, with a product assistant really makes sense for us and, and, and why the market is ripe for, for, for doing so. Okay. And, and since you started the company, what, what's the biggest roadblock that you hit so far and, and how did you overcome that? The biggest roadblock. Or the biggest challenge or roadblock. I think for us is we never satisfied. Uh, that's going to have been the, the biggest roadblock of accepting that, you know, things take time. I think as, as a founder, you just want things to move fast. You yeah. know, uh, if you can say it, if you can think it, you should be able to do it. In, in real life, that is not uh, how it is. And things take time. Uh, there's a trickle down effect in getting everybody on board uh, to believe in that. Uh, and also to be able to uh, take an idea and execute perfect and so on. So for us, you know, where we are today has been probably something we, you know, two years ago, particularly pretty accurately, this is what we want, but it has just taken time to get there. So, you know, the underlining effects of that is resource, if, you know, getting the talent, getting in and, and, and actually being able to say, okay, now we are ready to, 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 to do it as, you know, we believe back then. So it, it's somewhat as, as a founder, and I think that that's maybe the, the, the biggest challenge is having to accept that where you are mentally, it's something in, in the future because yeah. it takes time to, to grow to that, that level. And obviously now as the CEO, like all of the decisions kind of ultimately rest with you. You know, what, what is the, the critical factor within the business that you're constantly watching? Because you know, if we don't get that right, we're dead. Um, two things, um, which is traction, uh, com commercial, and for us, uh, it's also product traction. We measure a lot. Uh, and that is kind of the uh, lifeline for us as, as product people, but also as a CEO, CEO I, I track commercial traction a lot. But that's, the second part is team, is, is talent, bringing the right people at the right time and being able to give away that responsibility and gaining that trustworthiness at the, at, at the right point is, is uh, extremely important for us. And I think those two things are is really kind of, I think investors know me better than, than we as the founders do, but I think those two things is, is probably the, 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 the most important things that you want to be good at. Uh, definitely th th this early in, in, in a company as we are. 
And you mentioned there kind of one of the key parts is, you know, focusing on that team and, and how that's growing. So when, when you're kind of uh, hiring into the organization, other than kind of work experience and, and background, what, what are the key sort of personality traits that you think really set people up for success in a, in a startup? Um, one, curiosity. Two, want to be part of everything. Um, and three, ambition. Um, when I got my first job out of, uh, I was still in my bachelor's, um, I didn't have any of the experience to, to I think, uh, be good at what I was trying to get hired for. Luckily, you know, I think this startup said, why don't you join us? I think you, you, you seem stubborn enough to believe you can do this. Yeah. I think, I think in, in, in the, there are great talent out there, but at a startup, you definitely need to believe in yourself beyond what you currently need to do. Because it's the, the pace of change and the pace of requirements are so uh, f uh, changing so fast that you need to be able to adapt. So when, when we hire, we hire for somebody that is like, oh, this is an entry point, but I want this. I, I, I want to go beyond. I can see possibilities. I, I can see where this is moving. So somebody who um, obviously believes in the idea, uh, but they're believing in the self that they can have an impact on the idea is, is more importantly. And then being curious curious about that is, a, is a tremendously powerful for us. It's really interesting because in larger software companies, they're often really nervous about hiring people who are too ambitious because they're like, I want to, mm. I want to sit you in this role for two years. And, you know, if, if someone wants to grow, then they're just going to yeah. leave and go to another position. So it's a, yeah. you know, a, a big reason to join a startup there for everybody out there. Ab absolutely. So just to finish, um, I, I, I finish on this question for everybody. So what is your message for any kids out there who've got a big idea and no idea what to do with it? What would the, the practical steps be they can take to, to get on the right path with that idea? Work at it every day. Work at it every day, whether that is, you know, uh, writing it down, um, trying it out, um, asking friends, testing it, normalizing the big idea that it become reality only happens through exercise. And that can be a mental one, but it can also be a practical one actually creating it. Uh, for us, when we started Lairise, uh, we were um, good at, um, we were exceptional at product and design. We were okay at engineering. We took it upon us to learn to be great at engineering. Um, and I think luckily for, you know, for, for young kids today, um, you know, it, it, there are so many tools, so many resources mm. out there that you can really play, a, a, you know, try the, your ideas out. And doing that is, is the best way to get some, something rolling. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate you coming on, Evan, and thank you for joining us today. If people want to get in touch and, and discuss Layerize, um, is email or website or LinkedIn, what, what's the best way to, to get in touch? LinkedIn is, is, is my, way, um, my way to go, 100%. Okay, perfect. Well, I, I really look forward to seeing you scale this internationally. And uh, if I ever get uh, another paper manual in, in, my, uh, in my product, then I'll come asking you why that is and you haven't sold it to that company yet. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. Cheers. Thank you, man. Thank you.